I know a lot of you came to see John King, not me, and I'm all right about that. Um, I came to see John King. That's why I'm here. So seriously, I was supposed to take off this week, but when John said he could come, I said, forget vacation. I'm going to come here to see John King. Um, and so John, I know he's here somewhere. Where is he? I know Laura's here with him somewhere. Anyway, he is the president and CEO of the Education Trust, a national nonprofit organization that seeks to, some Ed Trust people here in the room, that seeks to identify and close opportunity and achievement gaps from preschool through college. And here's why I know him. John served as President of Barack Obama's cabinet as the 10th U.S. Secretary of Education during the Obama years. And prior to that, he was the Deputy Secretary of Education. But many of you here in New York know him from his role as um, when he served as the New York State Education Commissioner. You see the theme, he's steeped in education. But as you'll hear in a moment, John's personal story serves as a testament to the transformation of the power of education. And throughout his life, he's been an unwavering, dedicated uh, partner to equal opportunity for all in terms of education as a teacher, as a principal, and as a leader of schools and school systems. So please join me in welcoming my friend, John King, to the stage. I know he's here somewhere. That's why I had to get my big hug in. Um, so John um, is amazing, um, and, and I'm going to have him tell his story, but I have to tell you about the first time I met John at Acadiana when he was coming in to take the job as deputy secretary from somebody who was equally talented, and I said, are you sure you're up for this? You've got big shoes. I wish I'd never said that because this man is amazing. So why don't you give them a little bit of your story? Sure. Well, first, Carol is amazing, right? And <laughs> thank, thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, it is a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, so I'm a New Yorker originally. I, I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, went to, yeah. <laughs> uh, both my parents uh, spent their whole lives in the New York City public schools. They're both New York City public school teachers. Um, I went to New York City Public Schools as a kid, and for me, part of why I'm in education, really the main reason I'm in education, is because school saved my life. School is the reason that I'm sitting here today. Um, both my parents passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom, when I was eight, in October of fourth grade, uh, and then my dad when I was 12. And in the period when I, it was just, me and my dad, my dad had undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place where I didn't know what my father would be like from one night to the next. Um, some nights he would talk to me, some nights he wouldn't, some nights he'd be angry, some nights he'd be sad. Um, I can recall one night he woke me up at two in the morning, told me it was time to go to school. I remember being on the staircase in our house, holding on to the banister and my father saying, we had to go to school, and I kept saying to him, no, Daddy, it's not time to go to school. It's the middle of the night, and he didn't, he, I didn't understand what was wrong with him, and he didn't understand me, and he was pulling me on the stairs, and I was holding on to the banister, and then eventually he just went to sleep. And so that's how home was, day after day, this place where it just felt unsafe and uncertain, but school was this environment that was safe and engaging and compelling and interesting. Uh, I was blessed to really have a series of New York City public school teachers who made school a place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid outside of school. And I remember the stuff in fourth, fifth, sixth grade like it was yesterday. We read the New York Times every day. We did productions of Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream in elementary school. We did a production of Alice in Wonderland. I was the rose in Alice in Wonderland with big red felt petals sticking out of my head, right? And I remember those things like it was yesterday because school was really the center of my life. And um, even after my dad passed, it was always teachers who gave me a sense of hope and possibility. It would have been very easy for them to look at me and say, here's an African-American, Latino, male student, family in crisis, 
going to New York City Public School, what chance does he have? And written me off. And we know that happens to young people all over the country all the time, that people write them off. But I was blessed that I had teachers who chose to invest in me. But it also wasn't, wasn't a straight line. Even though teachers did have that investment in me and that sense of hope for me, I, when I was a teenager, I was angry, like a lot of teenagers who've experienced trauma. And I got in trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, and I got kicked out of high school. And I always tell folks I'm the first US Secretary of Education to have ever been kicked out of high school. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I hope that I'm not the last because part of my story really is about second chances, right? And about adults who had more belief in me than I had in myself. And so it was teachers and a school counselor and some family members who gave me a second chance after I got kicked out of high school and, and were willing to keep investing in me and to stick with me. And that is also part of why I'm alive today and why I do the work that I do. So I really, I, I became a teacher to try to do for other kids what teachers have done for me. And that's what drove me as a principal. It's what drove me in, into education policy. Always this question of how do we make sure that school can be the life-saving force that I know it was for me. Thank you. And so um, this is the short version of a story. It's really powerful. I mean, and I know you feel the emotion. So you talk about your K through 12 experience. Obviously, we're an institution of higher education here, mm -hmm. um, and we are majority minority. We are both an Hispanic serving institution mm -hmm. and a minority serving institution. And, and, and I'm going to ask you a lot of about those themes. But one of the things we hear in the national conversation is that why do we need a college education? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a trick, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for our population. Yeah. Can you tell us how, how you respond to that and, 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 and then what advice you have for us about how to counter that narrative? Yeah, yeah. Well, one is usually the folks who say that went to college themselves and their kids are going to college, right? So that's really about other people's children, right? It's like college isn't necessary for them. Um, you know, what I would say is I think it is true that college can mean different things and that post-secondary education can mean different things and that may be an associate's degree, it may be a bachelor's degree, but the truth of the matter is there just aren't that many jobs in the 21st century economy that you can do that will provide a family-sustaining wage that don't require some meaningful post-secondary degree or credential. And what, we've, what I think we've got to do as a society is figure out how do we make sure that college is accessible to everyone, affordable for everyone, and that students who start actually finish. And we haven't done a good enough job. President Obama would talk about the fact that we were once first in the world in college completion, and today as a country we're like 13th in the world in college completion. And we are losing our competitive edge in many areas as a result. And we're missing out on talent and opportunity. The reality is folks who have a college degree will make more than a million dollars more over their lifetimes. Uh, those who have a college degree are more likely not only to have success in the economy, but uh, have better health outcomes. Right? It, it's access to opportunity. It's a ticket to opportunity. And uh, there's a lot more work that we need to do to make sure that is available to everyone. For individual institutions, I think it's a question of figuring out how do you invest in students so that the students who start on the first day of that first year actually finish. And I know that's a priority for you and for CUNY as a system to think about how do we make sure that more students finish. And we know the things that get in the way. Sometimes it's financial obstacles. Often it's financial obstacles. Uh, as a country and, uh, and in the state of New York, there's been an underinvestment in public higher education. Pell Grants, for example, which help support low-income students going to college, are at a 40-year low in the portion of college that they cover. We ought to at least double Pell Grants, if not triple them. Uh, we know that states today are spending less on public higher education than they were in 2008. So we have states disinvesting and the cost then being passed on to students. So financial obstacles are part of the problem. We have to solve that, including those kind of emergency financial needs, the car breaking down, the not being able to get a Metro card, the things that will sometimes cause folks 
to not be able to complete. But then there are all the academic pieces. Uh, the academic support students need to be successful in their classes, the advising that students need to navigate uh, the course options and have a plan for how their degree fits into their life plan, the advising around internships and the connection to the workplace. And institutions can provide those kind of supports. And, and when you look across the country, the institutions that do that are getting better outcomes. I know that's why ACE is a priority for, uh, for you and for John Jay. And I, I just think there's a need to keep investing more in those sorts of supports. So um, John is on the board of Robin Hood, which is um, the entity that fi basically finances our ACE program. And we have modeled something called the Leap We Are um, Leap on the best things that we've learned from ACE and some of our other cohort programs. So the um, benefit of this conversation is John and I know we have tough conversations. Mm -hmm. And just because you all are out there listening, I'm not going to not get the advice I need from him. So, um, <laughs> so one of the things that, that is a, um, an opportunity and a very much a positive for us is that we are a minority serving institution. Mm -hmm. We are also an Hispanic serving institution. And, and from my perspective, we are both of those things because our students are choosing to make us those things. Mm -hmm. They are coming here and making us, and we have over 50% of our students now are, are Latinx. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, uh, over um, about 20, 25% of our students are African American. Many um, don't see the world in binary as some of us do, and they are both, which mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. So help us, give us some advice about how we navigate being an Hispanic serving institution and really meaning serving, yeah. not just getting money from the Department of Education because we have that mm -hmm. designation, while also addressing the tension between other groups that may feel as if that, that there's a choice that has to be made. Can you help us yeah. navigate through that? Yeah. yeah, it's such an important question. I, I think, the, to me, the serving part is the part that is often missing in institutions that it's not just a designation about the demographics of the student population. It has to be a, the organizational philosophy. So are the faculty representative of the diversity of the students? Right? And we know across the country that is a big disconnect between who our students are and who the faculty are. And not just uh, adjunct faculty, tenured faculty, right? which, which is an issue in many uh, institutions. There's the question of the staff and whether or not the staff are representative of the diversity of experiences of the students. Uh, there's the question of the curriculum and whether or not students see themselves in the curricular experiences. We know, for example, that institutions that have made investments in ethnic studies and opportunities for students to, to have both windows and mirrors in the curriculum see a real benefit in terms of student outcomes. Um, there's the sense of belonging that students have, and that is signaled in all manner of ways. How we, um, the rituals of the community, uh, what we celebrate, what we recognize, who we celebrate, who we recognize, all of that sends a signal about, about belonging for all groups of students. Uh, and then whether we help students um, across culture and across race and across income, have experiences where they see the world from other people's perspectives. And that is, a, that is to me, is an, an essential part of a good education, is being able to uh, have that experience. When President Obama gave his uh, final address in Chicago, uh, he talked about To Kill a Mockingbird. Right? Oh, for the days of a president who would quote from literature. Um, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, he talked about this line from To Kill a Mockingbird about how you, you never really understand a person until you've seen the world from, from through their eyes, walked in their shoes, right? And this idea that part of what we want in educational experiences is, is for students to have that awareness. So, so to me, Hispanic serving is, is ultimately about sort of an approach to a culturally responsive instructional learning experience for all students in the institution. That, that's what doing it well means. Um, I know that's important to you. I know that's important to CUNY as a community. Um, but to do that well, we have to acknowledge where we're falling short and where the challenges are. And we have to be relentless about the data, who's, 
who's finishing, who's leaving, who's getting the summer internships, who's, uh, you know, getting the best grades, who's getting called on in class, and we have to keep interrogating whether or not we are doing enough to build a truly equitable community. And so you'd think he was here yesterday at the faculty development day from what he's saying, but he didn't see the agenda for yesterday, did you? No. 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 And so I want to um, give a shout out to our team to let you know that they are focused on these things. We are focusing on how to make the curriculum more, not just more relevant, more culturally aware and, and making sure we had a presentation yesterday where uh, someone showed them their curriculum development piece about um, all of the in the original curriculum syllabus, um, all the um, sociologists they were going to refer to were white, old white men. And they became aware of that and thought about it and they said, no, we're going to have women, we're going to have people of color. And, you know, and, 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 and so this school is thinking about those things, deeply working on them. And I just wanted to say thank you to the community out here for the things you're doing that, that you hear John saying that we should be doing. And so we can stand up and say, but are we doing enough? And so he mentioned faculty diversity and I'm just gonna admit it, I heard the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm failing on that. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm gonna admit where we do well and where we're not. And we have to diversify the faculty, the full-time tenured faculty. We have to diversify more of our leadership ranks here. I'm aware of that in case you think I'm oblivious. Um, but um, part of that is it's going to take us some time and those financial resources and trying to figure out how to be creative around that. So one of the things that we have less control over, and I could use some wisdom, there are horrible things that happen every single day in the, in the country. Um, the shooting in El Paso, the, um, the separation of children from their parents in Mississippi last week, and for months now, probably over a year now, um, at the border. Um, we have the shootings in Pittsburgh. We have the shootings in New Zealand. And so the challenge we have here as a community is um, how do we respond to those in a way that, that address the student needs and how do, and, and, and um, what do we as an institution of higher education, how do we respond and equip them for dealing with that kind of world? Yeah. I think we have to both support students in engaging in the national conversation, and we have to make sure that we are living our principles locally. So in, in terms of engaging the national conversation, you know, sometimes folks will say, I wonder what I would have done during the civil rights movement. Like, would I have, would I have done, would I have gone on the freedom rides? Would I have been willing to, um, uh, be subject to the hoses? Would I have participated in the lunch counter sit-ins? We don't have, as a, as, as a community, we don't have to ask what we would have done then, we have to ask what will we do now? Because we are living through a time of incredible injustice and the question is what is our individual kind of moral responsibility to act on that? And so whether that is participating in the political process or participating in protests or um, taking up service projects, but all of us have to ask what, what are we doing to try to tackle those injustices? And I think we have to support students around that and connecting, helping students connect what we see today with our broader history. Right, the, the history of this country around the treatment of immigrants, the history of this country around issues of race. Right, this, there's one way to think about this moment as an aberration, but it's also important to acknowledge that in some ways it is an extension of forces that have long existed in our country. Um, when you see these hate crimes, it's important that we understand the history of hate crimes in America and the way that they've been, hate crimes have been used to control, to oppress, to prevent progress. Uh, when you see folks defending um, the wide availability of weapons and how weapons are used in our society, it's important to understand where that tradition comes from and the role that violence played, for example, after the Civil War in the South as a way of, in a sense, trying to restore the oppressive force of slavery through another mechanism, right? That that's part of the tradition behind uh, the way that weapons are being used today. 
So we have to help students understand. At the same time, I think as an institution, we have to ask, what are we doing to live these principles? And so, you know, all higher ed institutions have undocumented students. Are undocumented students getting all of the supports that they should? Are we helping our undocumented students navigate issues like access to health care, which often can be a challenge? Are we helping undocumented students navigate their very real concerns about how their information will be used and who will be shared with. And so we've got to simultaneously engage, I think, in these national level debates, but then also think about what are we doing in our community to try to make it better. Thank you for that. And I, don't, I think you were backstage and you couldn't hear when we were going through our highlights, but uh, Cynthia Cavajal, who's right there, runs our Immigrant Student Success Center, and she's been um, going out in the community making sure that our professors and faculty and staff understand how we can be supportive of our students, many of whom are in mixed status families. Mm -hmm. um, and so particularly during this great time of uncertainty. Uh, have you heard of the phrase VUCU? Uh, we, we had a presentation this summer on uh, living in a VUCU world. Uh, what was it? Violent, uncertain, complex, mm -hmm. and I can't remember who, who's from student affairs and enrollment management. You remember that. Anyway, so the point of it is we're living through a lot of uncertainty here in this world that, again, that we don't control. But what I hope that we're doing here at John Jay is educating the next generation of leaders who I hope will do a better job than um, he's younger than me, than my generation did, and his is currently trying to clean up the mess from my generation. Um, but we're really counting on the next generation. Mm -hmm. Where are the students in the audience? Raise your hands again so he can see you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, I hope you feel the responsibility, but not feel it as weight, but feel it as an opportunity that, that we have, we're placing a lot of expectations on you. And we're having this conversation with Secretary King, I still call you that, um, because um, we are being thoughtful about how do we make sure that we equip you to go out into the world. So we know that there's a new Higher Education Reauthorization Act in the conversation. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's in there that's good, what's missing from it, and how we um, can get engaged in that process? Yeah. Well, at the moment, it's, the process is sort of stalled. Um, and I think there's a real open question whether or not Congress can get itself organized to actually pass something. Um, where, where I think students and faculty and institutions can have a powerful role is, is on, on a few issues. One is um, the Higher Education Act was a civil rights law. Right? It was passed originally in 1965. It was part of the package of 1965 civil rights laws, including uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's part of um, an extraordinary legacy of that period of trying to use government toward the purpose of advancing equity. And Lyndon Johnson, who was a teacher, was himself a teacher, you know, when he signed the Higher Education Act, he talked about it as a mechanism to try to make our society more equitable, to create opportunity for folks. And so the reauthorization ought to be true to that. If it's going to be true to that, a few things that need to be true. One is there has to be much more investment in helping uh, low and moderate income students afford college, addressing uh, the declining value of Pell Grants relative to the cost of college, investing in the institutions that serve the largest numbers of low income students and students of color, our public higher ed institutions, our community colleges, our minority serving institutions. Um, two, We've got to shift the incentives away from just enrolling students to making sure that they finish. And that means we've got to take on those institutions that consistently fail students. And one of the things uh, I hope a higher ed act will do is take on the for-profit higher ed industry, which has uh, predatory institutions that are taking advantage of students. Uh, they're leaving students saddled with debt and no useful degree. Um, and we got to take that on. The, the third piece is we have to ask how can 
the Hired Act reauthorization expand the circle of opportunity. So to me, that would mean we ought to allow federal financial aid to be accessed by undocumented students. Right? That's, that's one, yes, that's one important way to expand the circle of opportunity. Another, and something that we worked on together in the administration is, we ought to repeal the senseless ban on Pell Grant access for incarcerated students that was a part of the 94 crime bill. And we worked on the, the second chance Pell pilot you know, there are now 10,000 students around the country who are and benefiting. we're one of those. That's right, that's right, here at John Jay. And so we've got 65 colleges and universities, 10,000 students who are benefiting from that pilot, but there are hundreds of thousands of folks who could potentially benefit. Uh, we know that those who have access to higher education while incarcerated are dramatically less likely to return to prison. And we know it's transformative not only in their lives, but the lives of their families and their communities. And so we have an opportunity. There's a bipartisan bill to repeal the ban if a Higher Ed Act reauthorization happens. The, repealing the ban on Pell Grant access for incarcerated students to my mind has to be a part of that. So I, have to, I was going to get to that later, but I'm glad you raised it about Second Chance Pell. Um, so I have to tell you another story about how meaningful this work is, and, and John has the um, opportunity to see his work um, in real time, so he'll be meeting with some of our students who are beneficiaries of the Second Chance Pell. But I remember the day we had that announcement in, in Maryland mm -hmm. um, at, a, at a prison facility, one for the male side and one for the female side, who Goucher College had been paying for, in the absence of Pell, they'd been providing education um, for people who and families who are incarcerated and just we sat through a class that they had there and then we heard from the students tell the benefits not only for themselves of having an education but the impact on their families one they were staying engaged in their own child's education and looking at what their students were their their children were doing their report cards and saying and their kids knew that their parents cared and inspiring their own kids to go back to school and we've seen that through our Otisville project as well so um, what are you, um, I hate to say one, most proud of, tell us some of the things that you are most proud that you were able to achieve um, during your time being Secretary of Education. Mm -hmm. Well, well, certainly that, that work on, on set, launching Second Chance Pell was one of those things of which I'm very proud. President signed in December of 2015 the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and we did a lot of work at the end of the administration to get that launched, and the idea there was to try to help states and districts think about um, education more broadly than just English and math that we have to also think about science and social studies and student socio-emotional development. And ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, really created an opportunity for states to think more broadly about the definition of educational excellence and we tried to support states in that, in that work. We did a lot of work in the, in the Office for Civil Rights, including uh, issuing guidance on the protection of the civil rights of transgender students. And that is something that the current administration has withdrawn. But that guidance for many young people and for many families was the first time they felt seen and heard by their government. And that was a powerful marker of, of the need to respect the civil rights of all of our students. And what we've seen, even with the current administration backing away from those civil rights protections, we've seen states and districts and individual higher ed institutions step up to protect the rights of transgender students. Um, we did a lot of work on accountability for for-profits and trying to forgive the debt of students who've been taken advantage of by predatory for-profit higher ed institutions and trying to put in place an oversight regime so that students would not be taken advantage of by those institutions. Now again, the current administration is undoing a lot of that work, although they lose in court quite regularly in their efforts to undo our work. But nonetheless, we set a standard and we also created a path for states and uh, individual institutions to do better. And that ultimately is the work. You know, the, President Obama would talk about this idea that better is good. We not, may not get everything, 
But the goal is to make it better and to create the foundation for even greater success. So you think about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there are people who are alive today because of the Affordable Care Act. There are people with pre-existing conditions of access to coverage. There are families that are getting access to health care that otherwise wouldn't have. It's not enough. We have much more to do, but better is good. And whether it was in K-12 or the work we did to expand access to early learning or the work we did on, on higher education, we made it better and we laid the foundation for more progress. And we need some political change, but I am confident that over the long run, uh, we will build on that progress. And I think what you did was created a national conversation at a local level about what expectations people, what people should be doing. And so the phrase I like to use is, while federal leadership is nice, it's not required to sustain change and to keep moving change. So you're sitting in a wonderful place where you see a lot of trends in education. Mm -hmm. What are the things that we ought to be thinking about that we haven't raised in this conversation, or even if we have raised that we ought to go deeper in, to make sure that as an institution, we are really, um, doing, you know, equipping our students to be successful. We, we are data informed in everything mm -hmm. we do. We've been much, we're, you know, very good at tracking what's happening and beginning to add more metrics so that when we make investments, we can see how they're working. But what are the things we haven't thought of that you're seeing on the national landscape that we could benefit from here yeah. at John Jay? Well, there's a lot that you're doing. I, you know, I will say kind of three areas of, that, that I'm thinking a lot about lately. One is, um, what some people describe as basic needs insecurity, but the, the very large number of students in our higher ed institutions who are suffering with food insecurity or homelessness or inadequate access to housing, um, students who are struggling with um, access to health care themselves, um, those kind of basic needs need to be addressed. Our current model of financial support doesn't accomplish that. We have states that are talking about, including New York, where there's a lot of conversation about free tuition, but tuition is just a small portion of the cost of higher education and, and of being a student, right? We have a quarter of our college students as a country who are parents. Child care is a part of the cost of moving forward in your higher education. And so institutions asking themselves, what more can they do to tap into existing programs, uh, whether they're federal, state, or local programs to get those supports to students? What additional supports can institutions provide uh, to help students to, to navigate those, uh, those basic needs outside of the academic experience? So that's, that's one area. A second area is, I think we've got a lot of work to do as a higher education sector around connections to the workforce and careers. Uh, many institutions actually have very modest support, if any, for students as they transition from college to what's next. Uh, we know that affluent students have lots of social capital that they can deploy to get the internship, to navigate uh, finding the right job. You know, their parents can open their, their Rolodex. I guess people don't use Rolodexes anymore. Their parents can uh, make introductions for them, those kinds of things. But for first-gen students, for low-income students who don't have access to, that, to, to those opportunities, uh, the institution needs to support students in navigating that. And so figuring out what percentage of our students are doing meaningful internships that are paid that will help them advance towards the career they want to pursue. How are our seniors preparing for their careers and what's next? And then going back and talking to students a year out, two years out, five years out, to understand what feedback they have. What did, what did they feel like they got? What did they feel like was missing as they made that transition to careers? Um, yeah. So I was going to say that. Um, you are validating the things that we are putting in place and really focusing on. So we had Faculty Development Day yesterday. Um, Dean Dara Byrne, Associate Provost Dean Dara Byrne, um, talked about those equity gaps and looking at the numbers of our students of color who have access to internships, research opportunities. And so we are going to track that data from here going forward. And will the LEAP team stand back up again? Where'd they go? I know, I see you. I can see you even if you think I can't see you. So 
Um, one of the things that, that we're putting in place, again, from the learning about um, Robin Hood's investment in ACE is what can we do? And DeLandra right there runs the ACE program. You're gonna see him later. Um, one of the things that we know is that advising is key and linking them to experiences and opportunities. So we are, um, the $600,000 that we just raised over the summer that Robin was talking about, um, we raised $300,000 to support LEAP, which is focused on the 1,100 students who are not in any cohort program and trying to, uh, academic cohort program and trying to mm -hmm. focus on them and making sure they're getting these opportunities and access to things. So um, thank you for validating what we've been working on. Now, where's Laura? Because I have no sense of time. How much time do I have left? Oh, yeah. Six, Six minutes. minutes? Okay. So um, is there anything I haven't asked him that you all want me to ask? Oh, there was a, th uh, oh. So a, thir a third oh, thing. Sorry. That I'm no, sorry. No, no, Thank no, no, you. No, Thank no, you. No, it's good can, accountability. Can, no, the third thing I wanted to mention, especially for John Jay, is I, I just think John Jay sits at the intersection of education and the potential for criminal justice reform. And that work is so incredibly urgent for the future health and well being of the country. And we've made some progress, I would say, including at the federal level, um, on sort of dismantling the policies of mass incarceration, but it is not nearly enough progress. When you think of the tens of thousands of collateral consequences that get in the way of people uh, getting their lives back on track, when you think about the degree to which we use prison as our strategy as a country to deal with uh, mental health needs, we use it as our strategy to deal with addiction, uh, we use it in many places as our, our strategy to deal with poverty. Mm -hmm. And we've got to change that, and, and you are just uniquely positioned mm -hmm. to be a part of changing that. Uh, not only in, in training folks who will be activists, but also training folks who will be a part of the system, whether it's, um, whether it's as part of the police department or the corrections or... Um, uh, prosecutors or participating in law enforcement. We've really got to shift our mentality around the criminal justice system, and I just think you are uniquely positioned to do that. That's one of the things we believe, too. <laughs> so I'm looking to see, what haven't I asked you that you want to make sure that we hear? Mm. Well... <laughs> I'll just say, you know, there's so many good things that are that are happening here, and so much important work that that you are leading. And one thing that I worry about for faculty members in public higher ed who often have a very large burden. One thing I worry about for first-gen college students in particular, but college students living in this world of such uncertainty, is whether people are taking good care of themselves. And how do you create a culture of self-care? How do you create a culture where students and faculty are taking care of each other? Uh, making sure that there's good access to mental health services, making sure that people are leading healthy lives. Um, and, and actually, there's really an intersection between that and the criminal justice reform work, right? Because I think when, when, we, when we start to think about the condition under which um, folks live who work in the criminal justice system, there are many ways in which it is dehumanizing for those who are subject to law enforcement, but also dehumanizing to those who work in law enforcement and corrections. And so how do we create an ethic of mental health and well-being here on campus that then people carry with them into their, into their careers? That is so timely, right? Um. One of the things that, thank, where's Gerard? We have a wonderful counseling center under the leadership of uh, Gerard Bryant who came to us from BOP. And, um, one of the things we don't do well is we, well, we don't have sufficient resources, let me just say that, but at least we have a, 
program of awareness of wellness for our students, but we're trying to figure out how do we build that same infrastructure for all of us. And so in a world where you've articulated that, that the Pell Grant money is not where it should be, the state support after the economic downturn has, is, is not as robust as it could be. And let me just say for the record, New York State supports public education more than most of the other states That's in this true. country. No While it may not be what we need, it is, they, I, I just want to give them credit for how much of their, the support they give us. Um, that, you know, in some states it's as little as 20%, if that. Mm -hmm. We get much more than that from the state of New York, and I appreciate that. But given the uncertainty of federal and state support, where else, how else would you be going about um, identifying the resources we need to really do the things we ought to do effectively here yeah. at John Jay? Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts on that. One is I think we have to continue to work to make sure that elected officials have a good understanding of what is happening inside of public higher ed institutions and what some of the challenges are that students face. And I think you're right, New York, uh, compared to other states, does invest a significant amount in public higher ed, but in my view, ought to be more, and there ought to be more investment in the supports that students need to complete. And we've got to make that case. So, you know, every legislator in New York should know about CUNY ASAP and about ACE and about the work that's happening on CUNY campuses to help students actually finish. Um, every legislator ought to understand the scope of basic needs and security and some of the challenges students face around housing and food and childcare and healthcare. And, and so there's building that, that understanding amongst elected officials. But there's also the business community and making sure that the business community here in New York City understands that CUNY in general, John Jay in particular, are this incredible asset for the long-term health and well-being of the city's economy. And they ought to be loud voices with public officials for more investment in CUNY and more investment in John Jay. Uh, and so engaging with the business community, making sure that students are engaged with the business community, that faculty members are engaged with the business community, I think is an important lever. And then ultimately t telling the story, and I know this is something that, that you try to do, but telling the story of the ways in which John Jay is contributing on so many levels to the, the health of the city and the state and making sure that people know that story. Um, I don't think there's necessarily an appreciation for uh, the incredible results that you're getting for first-gen students, for students uh, who are overcoming huge obstacles in their lives, and getting students out in front of folks telling that story I think is hugely important.